at 6 o'clock on the 19th. So uh, we're going to go over there. Polito's was uh, very gracious. Um, I know when um, uh, the speaker family was going through everything uh, with Jason, uh, losing Jason, uh, those of you who don't know, I'm sure you know about it, but uh, um, the speaker family that they lost uh, Jason speaker, uh, and that was Mike and Janet's son. Uh, the Politos just took care of their family, their family meal. Uh, Mike and, J Mike and son, -in son in law, I'm sorry, son in law. Uh, uh, but yeah, it's it's their family, their their son in law. And uh, those of you who know, may not know him, uh, but I worked with him for years, and, and Politos was very gracious with them. And so it's good to, to go and fellowship, but it's also good to. to these, these places that, that take, uh, Cienegas takes great care of us. Many of you women that have been to any of our meetings here or conferences or whatever, they, they do an amazing job uh, catering all the time. So we love, we love working with them. And, and who doesn't love good Mexican food? I mean, come on. I was in New Jersey for a week, and I would not eat Mexican food because, like, it, it's not worth it, they may love it, and they may pack out the restaurant, but I'm not going to spend my money on Mexican food north of Texas, probably. <laughs> There's some good, Oklahoma has some good places, but uh, anyway, I digress, I digress. Uh, pray for our kids. Uh, we got back-to-back. -back. I, I actually pray for Tony and Marty. They're, <laughs> they're doing back-to-back -back camps this year. They're going to take 8- to 12-year-old kids on the 22nd, they're going to stay there, go to a laundromat, do their laundry, and we're taking a bus load of seven uh, to eleven, or excuse me, uh, seven and under kids that are signed up to go to camp. Uh, it's five to seven, I guess. Um, but we're taking a group. We're just going to drop them off, and they're going to do a whole other set of camp. Uh, but they're going to have a little help. Sheena's going to be there helping them. But uh, they're going to have a good, solid six, seven days of just camp. And uh, there's no forecast for uh, a whole lot of break in the weather, but we'll just pray, and maybe they'll get some rain, they'll get some relief down there. But good things are happening at that camp already. He's always uh, there working as a part of the staff, the rec crew, and uh, she sends us pictures and of them all getting all those uh, – you know, teenagers and, and young adults that are leading in the camps, getting around the altars, and just they they get it ready for them, and it's already pre-baptized, I guess, when they come in for camp. So they're not just uh, coming from a cold start. Uh, so we'll pray for all that. Um, lots of things going on this month. Uh, but uh, anybody have any prayer requests that we can we can lift up tonight? Yes. Yeah. For Brother Bullock, uh, those of y'all who, uh, he's been here multiple times, but he shared just very, just not in a big, you know, way, but he, he's he's going through uh, chemo uh, and dealing with uh, stage, I don't know, whatever, but cancer, and, uh, uh, but he, you couldn't tell by the way he was preaching Sunday, so I kept waiting for him to, just while he was shaking everybody's hand to go, Phoom, but he wasn't, he was energetic and and I don't know how he was at dinner, but uh, it, he just seemed to be really fired up, and I'm, I was excited. I was glad. Uh, they always do such a great ministry um, uh, when they come. I was really glad to get to be with them Sunday. Anybody else? Anything else? Miss Martha? Okay. Some kind of virus. Okay. All right. Miss Sherry? Okay. Okay. All right. Absolutely. Um, thinking about uh, Troy traveling this week. I'm gonna pray for him. I know that's not an uncommon thing, but uh, uh, it's hot and, you know, there's tire tread flying all over the roads and stuff, so we just pray for his safety. Um, 
Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, man, once this hot, you got to make sure your tires are in good shape. And uh, Caden was in New Mexico, and he that boy has more problems with tires than anybody I've ever met. But he was in New Mexico and had a flat tire. And, uh, yeah, so he had to go down and buy a new one. Uh, and they don't have any of the chain places, so he had to go to, you know, Billy Bob's Tire Shop or whatever and, and pay an arm and a leg. But I said, well, you just that's what you do. You got to own a car. It, you know, it's still till, you can't just buy it one time. You get to buy it for the whole life of the car. That's how that works. But um, anyway, but yeah, just praying for safe travels for Troy and, and all those that are on the roads. Uh, I think about uh, y'all's employees. Um, with WTS, just all that. My guys, I got guys running up and down the highway. Uh, just, you know, there's, <clears throat> we, uh, when I was in New Jersey, uh, I'll just share this real quick and then we'll pray. But uh, it's amazing. <laughs> God can break through the weirdest situations and show himself mighty. Uh, there was a lot of different type of folk up in that New Jersey area. Uh, that that work up there with us, and I, you know, it's just not it's not the Bible Belt, it's not Southern hospitality. It's just a different place. Nothing wrong. They were all very courteous and generous, and and all that. But man, they're just their view on life is just different. Uh, the, talking to people about their families, just I just didn't even know what to say. Sometimes I was like, okay, that I'm just gonna see you tomorrow. Like I don't even know how to really comment on that. But there was one instance, we were standing there and got a phone call about a technician who they had to call the paramedics because a pole had broken, and he all they knew was he was unconscious, had a broken leg and a broken arm. Um, so immediately, obviously, we're all a little panicked because I don't know the young man, but they do, obviously. It's in their market, and, and so they were apologizing to us. I said, dude, if it was my tech, I'd... I wouldn't have even told you what was going on. I'd have just left and, you know, try to go take care of him. Well, as it was, <clears throat> this young man was working on the cable, and in fact, the cable pole did break while he was up on the pole. But just by the grace of God, there was a power company truck two two blocks over, and they saw this guy because he was wearing his bright yellow vest and had his orange cones out and everything, and they said, you know what? we're working on the power, we're going to go ahead and just turn off the power going that direction. Well, when he fell, it slingshot him right into the power lines. And he bounced off and hit the ground, and that's how he broke his arm or whatever. But you know, if they had not have turned off that those power lines, it probably would have been us going out to a dead-on-arrival type of deal. And I just you know, openly was like, man, that's just a miracle. And they and all these guys who were pretty strange, <laughs> some of them were like, man, that, that has to be a God thing. And so if we didn't have anything in common during those times, they could agree that it takes God to do something like that, to spare that young man's life. He, he actually was not a direct employee of the company. He was a vendor, but it doesn't matter. It was a life and all lives matter, right? Like the, the, the unborn, born, that work for my company, don't work for my company. I don't ever want to walk up on some scene with some young man, you know, burned or, damn, you know, murdered. Not murdered, but you know what I'm saying. Just uh, taken too soon. And uh, the Lord wasn't ready, so he protected him. And I'm thankful he does the same thing for us. He his, He's just ever a present help in the time of need um, and even when we don't know why he or how we got out of a situation I always think about God going yeah it wasn't as dire as you thought I had you the whole time and so I just want to pray that uh, uh, his protection over so many right now uh, heat, heat exhaustion all those things but uh, also for the names that you mentioned Sue and then for little Cooper um, and then also for brother Alan so, Father, we just come before you tonight. God, I don't have enough uh, words in my vocabulary to express how good you are. Lord, you see things well ahead of us. You understand 
the makings of our bodies, the inner workings of every cell and, and nutrient, everything that's woven together, God, in this, this skin tent that we have. God, we just ask that you touch uh, the, these cancer issues. Lord God, we don't know how to treat them. We, we come up with all these devices and these pills that are poison. But God, I know that just one touch of your spirit, Lord, can flush out that, that sickness, can, can, can cure all disease. Lord, we're going to see tonight, Lord, in your word, where you took someone who the world called dead and you raised them to life again. Father, we just give you praise for that. I pray for little Cooper. Lord, I, I just ask, Father, it's, it's miserable to be sick, much less in this kind of heat and weather. So I pray for him and his healing. I pray for his mama and his dad and his, his uh, nanny and the whole family who was helping to take care of that young, young precious boy. And Lord, I pray for safe travel for Troy, for uh, all of the, the friends and family that we have that are running up and down the roads, trying to make a living and trying to get to the places that you designated. God, I just ask for your protection. Kids going to camp, experiences with salvation at camp. And God, we just know you're faithful to all of it. We give you praise tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, uh, Larry is bringing around the offering plate if you'd like the opportunity to, to give tonight. Uh, we appreciate that so much. Um, <clears throat> if you have your Bibles, we're going to kind of jump around a little bit tonight, but uh, we're going to start in, in uh, uh, Acts chapter 8. We're, we're continuing on in our teaching of Acts. We, I did go ahead and just stay with the schedule, so it's Lesson 6 if you have your, your book and you want to jump in there. But for the week that uh, you were gone, Pastor, I, I preached about the, uh, the assurance that we have in the book of Acts. And, and, and I was just reading through all of these weeks of study, and I, I, I love the book of Acts. To me, um, uh, it, it's kind of <laughs> preposterous, I'll just use that word, to, to not take them into consideration when you're talking about the work of Jesus Christ. I know that the Gospels directly talk more about the life and the ministry of Jesus, but the powerful thing is that the life and the ministry of Jesus is executed through His church, through His body, in the uh, book of Acts, through the power of Jesus Christ and of the Holy Spirit. It is, it is brought to life by this movement of his people that love him and are called according to his purpose. And it's to me, it's just such a revelation of how impactful those 40 days must have been between the time that he uh, rose from the grave until he ascended, right? And then we know that there was about 10 days after he ascended that, that Pentecost, as we know it, happened with um, uh, they were already having the Feast of the Pentecost, but the visitation of the Holy Spirit evidenced by speaking in other tongues and other manifestations of His power. But it's so awesome to watch these stories unfold because if you're, if you're looking at it from a historical perspective only, this is a Genesis moment, if you will, because now we've started back to where there's just a pocket of people and it grows. And then they face a little opposition and it shakes a little bit, but it's like and I'm not I'm not a great scientist, but you know, in science they'll they'll do these experiments when we were in chemistry in high school, you would do these experiments and you'd introduce a little heat or you'd introduce a little disruption, you'd add another little chemical that you'd think was going to neutralize the element, but all it did was excite it, right? The heat like in a, even in a bowling you know, beaker of water, all it does is excite those molecules in there, and now they begin to expand. It begins to grow and boil over, if you will. So in, in Acts chapter 8, and what I spoke about a little bit was that we were looking at Stephen, this, this uh, early elder of the church, one of the first elders ever appointed uh, by the disciples to be someone to go on and continue in the ministry, somebody to uh, bring, um, you know, organization to his people to, to help them to be able to meet needs. We, 
We read in Acts chapter 2 where it said that all these people were bringing all their stuff together, right, and and meeting the needs of the church. Well, who were they going to get to do that? They had to appoint people, right, to to fill those roles. And then you had, uh, uh, obviously, people were coming out of the woodworks. You know, Barnabas was giving land, and people were giving of their money and of their possessions. And so all this had to be organized somehow. God ordains these people, and Stephen, one of these men, is so fired up that he gets himself in trouble with the, with the leaders of the time. And he begins to preach a message that is, is condemning, quite frankly, because it says, you all played a role in the death of this Christ. This Jesus Christ who we worship and who we attest to you played a role in his death. And it said, he, he shared with him that there was all of these things uh, that were taking place in the, in the uh, Old Testament and all these prophecies that were fulfilled by their actions. And all this did was make them good and angry. And so, again, like a little bit of heat being applied, they're, they're getting riled up and it and it's kind of culminates in this moment where Stephen is is taken out of the city, is taken out of the city, and he's stoned to death uh, by those those people who would would be in opposition to the church, to the to the new church, to the Christian church. You know, in some places they called it the way because uh, uh, Jesus said, "I am the way." So they were called. They had all kinds of different names. You know, what's interesting is you don't find really that much in the Bible or that I've found in my study where it ever calls us Christians. But the word Christian just means someone who uh, uh, bears out Christ's name. My name, Christopher, uh, I love it because it didn't mean anything to me much when I was young other than it was one of those good... Christopher, John, I feel like if there's four syllables in your name, it's real easy to get yelled at by your mom or your aunt or something. Two syllables probably works pretty good too because I or Gary D. I don't know. There's something about syllables, you know, uh, is, but mom saying Christopher, John, you know, then I knew something had to, had to give, but I learned as I got older that my name meant one who bears Christ. And so I always felt like God, that was my name for a reason. Uh, when we named Zoe, uh, we changed her name at about the eighth month. I've shared this many times. We were going to name her Abigail. Her name was going to be Abigail, but most of the people who know her now are like, I could never picture you as an Abigail. You are a Zoe. Zoe means life, and we didn't know in the first two weeks of her life that that was going to be a prayer we would pray over her to even be able to breathe, to say, your name means life, and we changed. I, I really feel like that the Holy Spirit impressed upon Amber and I to change her name to mean life. And so there's something in a name, there's something in being called a Christian, but <clears throat> you have these people who were in high opposition to it, and they didn't like it. One of them's name was Saul, uh, and Saul did not approve of this way. He was a devout Jew, and many of you know the story, what's actually going to be our lesson next week, so I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. But in chapter um, 8, where it starts out, it says that uh, uh, now Saul was consenting to his death. And, uh, and it begins to talk about a great time of persecution that came upon this church that had exponentially grown from three people that were at the tomb when Jesus rose again to some 500 people that he showed himself to, is what the Corinthians tells us, 500 people or so, that he showed himself to in those 40 days. And then it dwindled again to the only the 120 or so that showed up to go into the upper room. But then it bounced back to 3,000. And so you had this activity going on. And now persecution began to fall on the church. And, and Saul was standing there holding the coats of all the men so that they could throw rocks at Stephen while he was being stoned to death. And this, you know, it just it shows you the evilness that was in the, the pit of, of the man that was Saul because he didn't just, he didn't uh, uh, remorse 
He didn't have any repentance at that time over what had happened because it just fired him up even more. It says that he would go uh, wreak havoc on the church. It says in verse 3, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Wouldn't that be something? If that was what we were really facing today, at least in our country. Now, I know there are places that they do. But certainly here, sometimes we act like this is what's happening to the church, that we're being drag, drug out of our homes and taken to prison. Well, that's not necessarily the case. Now, there are obviously things that we do face persecution from certain groups or, or whatever. But what I want to just remind us about tonight is that uh, sometimes when, it, when a catalyst, when some kind of opposition rises up in our lives, in our ministries, in our, just our ability to witness... Uh, God has a plan in that. Um, I heard, uh, I, I think um, Anush said this Sunday, and it's kind of stuck with me. She said, sometimes your disappointment is God's appointment. And I, like I said, I don't know if everybody heard that because of her thick accent, but she was testifying about how she missed her, she missed the exit to the Chili's that she always goes to, and then when she got diverted, she ended up at a brand new Chili's that was giving away free food. So she said, thank you, Daddy God, because she was so disappointed, but it was a divine appointment for her. Well, this kind of leads to a divine appointment for Philip. Philip is an evangelist. He's a follower of Christ. And in, in, in verse 5, it says, uh, well, I'll, I'm sorry, can I go to verse 4, Miss Kathy? I know I, I put verse 5 up there. But therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. So they say, well, why didn't they just stay there and stand their ground? They listened to what the Lord was doing. They, they acted. And can you imagine us just saying, well, we're getting, we don't like the way Mineral Wells is treating Christians. What if we all went somewhere and just found a new place to minister? That doesn't happen very much. But that's, I mean, that's the mindset of what they were doing. It was worth more to them to leave their livelihoods to go spread this gospel than it was to stay and just say, well, we can deal with a little persecution. Oh, you know, gloom, despair, and agony is on us. Our reward will be in heaven. That, that wasn't their mindset. And I'm thankful that they had the wherewithal because they remembered the words of Jesus when he promised them the Holy Spirit back in Acts chapter 1 and in Luke chapter 24. What did he say? That you will receive this Spirit and you will preach into Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and all the parts of the world. He says it in Matthew chapter uh, uh, 28 in the Great Commission. He says, you're going to go and baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So they took all those words to heart, and here they go. Um, in verse 5, it says that he went out to the city of Samaria, and he preached Christ to them. And when the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. We know from just studying through the Gospels, Samaria was not a place of religion. It was not a place of, of devoutness. It was a place where there was all kinds of unclean spirits and things going on. It goes on to say in verse 7, uh, um, <clears throat> uh, the, the unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed, and there was great joy in that city. What an amazing revival that he could have hunkered down right there in Jerusalem and said, I'm going to fight this, I'm going I'm to stand fast against Saul. But he said, you know what, there's other people that need the gospel, and they're not too far down the road. I'm going to strap up my, my sandals, and I'm going to go out, and I'm going to see what we can do. And when he gets to preaching, he, this man named Simon uh, begins to hear about him. And it says in verse 9, it says that he was a certain man called Simon who previously had practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great, to whom they all gave heed and, and from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. Well, if you're living in this time and you're doing some tricks and some sorcery and you're, you know, you know, making things appear out of thin air and your little smoke, little mirrors, whatever they were doing. And people say, oh, this must be of God. I'm not going to argue with them because they're paying him some money. They're, 
they're acknowledging him as some kind of great and powerful, you know, the great and powerful Oz, if you will. You know, he he's he's got him he's got him in the palm of his hands, and this this other guy comes to his town, named Philip, and he begins to see all this stuff happen, and he goes, "Wow, you know, I'm I'm all smoke and mirrors. I don't know how to make unclean spirits come out, and I certainly don't know how to make people get up." and walk that have, that have been lame and paralyzed. And so he says, he's astonished, and in uh, verse 11 it says, And they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. But when they all believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Why? Because they were signifying in a place where... There was no formal religion. He was saying, this is a place for you to be baptized. I I talked about this several weeks ago. I felt like it was a miracle that Peter preached and 3,000 people came to know the Lord, but I think it's a miracle that they baptized him. I mean, that, that had to be one long service. Right? And 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 or or something, or they had a big river or pond to work with, or something, you know. But if he if he went out and baptized each one of them, but Philip was following in this tradition that had became to be part of something in the church that Jesus himself had done, and so he saw him be baptized. Then Simon himself also believed, and when he was baptized, he stayed with, he continued with Philip, and he was amazed seeing the mirac- the miracles and signs that were done. What's so crazy about this, um, and many of you kind of know what happens, we'll talk about it in just a second, but um, what what an encouragement for Philip that he uh, you know he goes to this town he he avoids you know for the time being he avoids any kind of persecution uh, uh, any kind of imprisonment things like that he goes to Samaria he's having let's just say it honestly like he's having all this success as a minister if you're going out and you're preaching you you want to be like Philip you don't want to be like Jeremiah who preached for years and years and years and never saw a convert. Here, you're Philip, and the power of the Lord is just working within you, and and you're seeing people saved, you're seeing them get baptized, and then you have this notable guy come, and he professes, and I'm sure, I'm just, again, doesn't say this, but I'm sure he didn't, like, come up quietly. I'm sure he was, like, you know, walking to the, walking to the, to the altar like this, going, hey, everybody, look. I'm going to get saved. And he gets baptized and he begins to be a part of Philip's ministry team. But I can tell you that, you know, as a minister, man, you get some of those kids, you get some of those adults that come to your church or, or whatever, and they seem to walk away from the craziest things in their life. And you get so excited about what God's fixing to do in their lives because they get saved, right? And only to be kicked in the gut a little bit later, because what does Simon do? At some point, he approaches them and says, Hey, uh, uh, in verse 14, he says, Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they went to Peter. And they sent Peter and John to them, who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them. And he had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Here it is in verse 18. When Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me the power also that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter rebukes him and says, May your money perish with you. I I don't... It doesn't really specifically talk about this here, but having gone through some things where you you got you 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 prayed for somebody and you ministered to somebody and they finally walked out of whatever life it was, whether it was drug addiction or 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 you know a bad relationship or just flat out just being rebellious against the things that they had been taught all their life, and you, you lead them to salvation and you feel like they're just really they're winning, right? They're they're winning. And then they just can't help. The Bible says that uh, we're like dogs, right? 
that return to our own vomit. And I know that's a, man, isn't that a gross and, and um, a descriptive metaphor? But, uh, I mean, isn't it kind of gross when we see people that, that they walk back into that life? And, and we don't know if this was the end of his road. We don't know if that was a, a rebuke in word only, but that maybe he was convicted. We don't know all of those things. But I can also imagine that for Philip, that had to be a little bit of a discouragement because here you'd had this prominent person dedicate their lives to the Lord, get baptized, be a part of your crew, and then when you know some other leaders show up, they, they embarrass you in front of everybody. You realize... Man, what did I? You go. What did I miss? Was I was I wrong? Was I? I mean, I'm I'm being real candid this morning, but Pastor knows what I'm talking about. You just, man, it it it, it cuts you deep. But the reason I'm saying that is because I love the fact that it didn't really dissuade Philip to the point where he wasn't willing to go do more work. You have again, you you have the assurance of Acts is. You have success, and then you have struggle. And then you have success, and you have struggle. But it seems like every time that the success comes, it's much greater than the little bit of struggle that we saw. And we're encouraged because that doesn't stop after the book of Acts. Just like we don't believe that the gifts of the Spirit have passed away and that it was only for the apostles, there are lots of, uh, of denominations that, that believe and will preach that. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll challenge that notion that the, the Spirit exists for today. Just like the Spirit exists for today, this principle of Acts that a little adversity is just like adding a little heat to the water. It just gets the water boiling, and, and eventually it's going to come out of the pot. Amen? So he <clears throat> moves on into Acts um, chapter 8, still in chapter 8, uh, and he's... Uh, verse 26, it says, Now the angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go towards the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. <laughs> it's like the Lord calling somebody to Monahans, Texas or whatever. You know, we, we got fa- folks in the church that are moving to go out there to... Uh, 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 start a fire department. Uh, we got folks that are going out there to work in uh, the oil fields and things like that. And it's it can be pretty bleak landscape-wise at times. Um, I know that we don't have a lot around here, but we do have some trees, right? And uh, we got some hills, so the earth that you doesn't look like you can see the edge of the earth when you're looking out that down I-20 from here. Uh, you you can see a little bit of a landscape. But he says it's the desert. So what does he do? He complains about having to go to the desert. No, that's not what he does. He says he arose and he went. And behold, he finds a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge over all of her treasury, and he had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning. And sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said to the Philip, Go near and overtake this chariot. Verse 30 says, So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you're reading? And to kind of paraphrase what happens next, he says, Well, maybe you can tell me. And so Philip, in the desert, jumps up into this total stranger's chariot and says, Let me explain. And it says... <clears throat> Verse, uh, in verse 32, it says, uh, The place in the scripture which he read was, He was a, led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before the shearer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation, for his life is taken from this earth? There are some scholars that believe that this eunuch was... Uh, uh, Probably actually from Ethiopian descent, so from from you know from Africa, south of uh, Egypt or west south and west of Egypt, um, and that he was on this long journey 
because he was a be- he was a believer of sorts. He uh, uh, he he prescribed to the idea of God and that you should go and, and worship in his temple, but yet he did not know any who Jesus was, and so he has this opportunity to be told this this verse here because that's a pretty sad verse. Just just read that without the foreknowledge that we we all get the benefit of you know, hindsight. We all get the benefit that we have the Word of God and all of its entirety, you know, at our fingertips. But for someone who doesn't understand the story that's being written, even in chapter in Acts right now, he doesn't understand that this Jesus, this lamb that was led to slaughter and didn't even open his mouth. Uh, and again, pictures. Have you ever seen a sheep that's been sheared or, or anything that isn't, you know, raising a fuss. I'm not a farm boy, but I've seen some sheep getting sheared, even at school field trips or at, at some kind of farm. And you never just see them going, you know. They're always making a fuss. And the farmers are always having to just manhandle them and work them and the shepherds or whoever does that. And uh, so a visual of this sheep that walks to the slaughter and just never says a word. And he explains to him, this is Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and he says, you can believe in this Jesus Christ, that he died and rose again. And I love the response of the, of the eunuch. He says, well, why can't I get baptized over there in that muddy water? Again, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but they were in the desert after all. He says, why can't I get baptized right here? So he jumps down out of his, out of his chariot, off of his high horse, if you will. And he gets baptized. The Lord called Philip after some disappointment. He, he, he left Jerusalem from persecution. He left the place in, in Samaria because uh, of uh, the ministry was being done there was awesome, but God called him to do something else. He'd had disappointment, but he just continued on and walked out this ministry that God has called him to do. And so he does this uh, impromptu baptism. And it's a real powerful thing because it can, just kind of continues to show us that it's powerful to make that declaration that, hey, as of today, something's changed. Was that man reading? I mean, let's talk about it for a second. Wasn't the guy reading the Bible? I mean, if you read the Bible, aren't you pretty much a good person? I mean, that's, that's a lot. I mean, any more, find somebody who actually reads the Bible it doesn't go to church is kind of a unique find. Not kind of a unique. There is no there is no scalability to the word unique. It is a unique find to see somebody who's reading the Bible but doesn't darken the door of a church. Usually if you do find it, it's somebody who's trying to find fault in it. But here was this man. Maybe that was his intention, but it wasn't his outcome because Philip... you. Follow the prompting of the Lord. Um, I, move in to moving off of Philip a little bit, and we jump to <clears throat> uh, chapter nine, uh, verse thirty-six. A little heading in my Bible is just a story about a woman named Dorcas. Uh, and I used to think that was the weirdest name. My sister had a friend named Dorcas. And I always thought it was like short for being a dork, or like a long word for being a dork, you know. But Dorcas actually meant like a tree or a gazelle. It was something elegant. The name meant something elegant. And that's how she was revered in her community, as something elegant. In fact, her name was Tabitha, but the people called her Dorcas because she was charitable she was giving. Um, a lot of people believe this is at Joppa, the town of Joppa, and it was full of charitable works and good deeds that she had done. And it was likely because after the persecution in Jerusalem of the Jews and those new Christians, these new Christian folks or whatever, the followers of the way, uh, uh, they were likely refugees of sorts. But does she say, you know, uh, no, I don't know what to do with you? No, she begins to make them clothing. She begins to do all these, these selfless acts 
and she becomes sick in verse 37. It happened in those days that she became sick and died. They had washed her and laid her in an upper room. And since Lydia, uh, since Lydia was near Joppa and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent two men to him. Now this is not Philip, this, is, this was Peter that was going to visit. And he jumps up, it says, uh, they were imploring him not to delay in coming to them. Verse 39 says, he, Peter arose and went with them. And when he had come, they brought him into the upper room. And all of the wid- widows stood by him weeping, showing him the tunics and the garments which Dorcas had made while she was with them. That's important because what does the Bible say about true religion? It's taking care of widows and, and orphans. And here was a woman who dedicated, you know, her her living, you know, her living testimony to being someone who could provide for others, and it, so impactful that they they were like, look, look at these beautiful garments we have. And so Peter, uh, he put them all out. As they, they were crying and carrying on, and he put them all out of the room. And it says that he knelt down and he prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. She opened up her eyes, and then she saw Peter. Uh, when she saw Peter, she sat up. And then he gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when she had called the saints and the widows, he presented her alive. Now this word travels fast. But here's another example of Peter, uh, um, you know, just just saying, hey, look, I, I don't know what to do, but I can pray. I, I don't have any silver or gold, but I can pray. I, I don't know what to do about your clothes. I, I can't make you any more clothes, but I can pray. And so he prays, and he does this, uh, making the, the, the statement to arise, to, to get out of your bed and walk. This wasn't just like a catchphrase. You know, he wasn't like, I am Batman. Like, this wasn't his, his, you know, what he had to say so he could trademark it. This was his understanding of watching Jesus having done the same thing. Remember that there was a couple of cases, obviously, besides Lazarus, where Jesus rose the dead from the grave. Uh, uh, and, and so he, he just says, arise, and then <clears throat> she gets up. And so it became known throughout all this area. Now, another area, it's just it's it's crazy now. You you thought you started a little fire, a little campfire, but now boy, it's getting getting crazy. It's getting out of control. Uh, and so all of these people began to believe. There was this amazing resurrection. It was awesome too because it was it kind of showed us that uh, uh, there's nothing wrong with having, you know cumulative faith. In other words, there's nothing wrong with us all coming together. But now sometimes we, we do have to be mindful because Peter did put all the, the crying out of the room so he could do the work of the Lord. Sometimes you have to be careful when you're rejoicing with those that rejoice or you're weeping with those that weep that you don't get caught up in how good it feels to just cry about things. And I'm sure that not all of those women that were there were there just to make a scene, but I'm sure some of them were, right? And so that's why that's why Peter had to just say, you know what, could everybody step out? I need everybody out of here right now. But it was an amazing thing. The power that they saw uh, working in that time began to just change things. It says that um, there at the end of the verse, it says... Uh, it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed on the Lord. And so it was, he stayed many days in Joppa with Simon the Tanner. The last little thing we're going to talk about, we got just a few more minutes, is uh, Acts chapter 10. It's another very, very um, uh, memorable story, a uh, familiar story about uh, Peter, another experience that Peter has with a man named Cornelius. And uh, there's a couple things I, I love about this story. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, Cornelius is a Roman centurion. He's in charge of probably a hundred soldiers or so. It's about back in that time, a regiment was somewhere around 600 soldiers, and he was the commander of a part of a regiment. Uh, so theologians and historians kind of 
just for just for you know historical context, he had about a hundred men that reported and did what he said to do. Uh, when I did talk about this a couple of Sundays ago, I it never tells us in the Bible the name of the man who comes to Jesus and says, "My servant's at home sick," and Jesus says, "Well, I'll come to your home," and he says, "No, no." Uh, uh, you're a man of great authority, and I'm a man of great authority. When I tell this soldier to go, they go. When I tell him to sit, they sit. And he's like, and you too have authority, so if you'll just say the word, my servant will be healed. And Jesus turns to everybody and says, I've never met anybody with this kind of faith. And he says, go home and your servant will be healed. Well, we don't know this, and I, I don't even really want to protest, but I would imagine if this isn't the same guy, Maybe he knew that guy. Maybe he knew that other soldier that, or heard the testimony about, hey, this guy Jesus, you know, he, he spoke and, and my servant was healed. It was incredible. So somehow all these seeds, what I'm getting at, all these things that Jesus had done in his ministry were now going to come to fruition in another way because there was this man named Cornelius It says he was a, a devout man. He was a prayerful man. Uh, in verse 2, it actually says, A devout man and one who feared God with all of his household, who gave alms generously to the people, prayed to God always. And about the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly a vision of an angel of God coming in to say to him, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? We know that... The, the, the angel told him that he was going to need to descend for Peter because, or someone was going to come visit him, excuse me. Uh, uh, he's there, Simon, uh, Peter is there, and uh, uh, he's going to tell you what you must do. And then he spoke to him and he takes off. I want to just point out a couple of things and to, to wrap our religious minds around, just, just for a point of reference. This guy was a good guy. He gave money to those who needed it. He prayed every day. Had his whole family praying every day. But you know what he didn't have? Jesus Christ. Angels appeared to this man, but you know what he didn't have? Jesus Christ. He didn't know what he didn't know, right? So it was, it was it's a great opportunity to understand that some people have taken this life of faith and trivialized it as being a good person, giving some money here and there, believing in angels, believing in devils, believing in God. Angels, I mean, I believe in them. I, we pray all the time for protection. I don't know that I have an assigned guardian angel that follows me around or whatever, but uh, I, if I did, it, they'd probably need two uh, just because I can be stupid sometimes. But uh, or have been stupid sometimes, but uh, I know this that the demons even believe in God and tremble. And tremble. In, in fact, when Jesus got very close to him, they started squealing and saying, "Not now! It's not our time!" And he cast him into some pigs, and they all went and jumped off a cliff. Right? We know those stories in the Bible. But here's a guy that defies. To me, it's. It's such a poignant story for this day because there's a lot of people that are doing good things in the world. They give money, that don't aren't atheists. They believe in a God or they believe in a heaven or a hell or, or probably just heaven because, you know, why would a good God allow anybody to go to hell? We, we don't have time to go into that doctrinal uh, fallacy. But... It's a perfect example of what God can do because he sends this angel to talk to him. And when the right man who listens to God, at the same time that he's having this angel visit, Peter's asleep and has this weird dream about eating skunks and all kinds of other things. It doesn't make any sense. And I'd probably wake up and be like, oh, I shouldn't eat that before I go to bed. It makes me dream crazy stuff. But he was prompted by the Lord to understand that it meant it wasn't just about food. It was about the, the dominion that God has over the sinner 
and over the saved. And it was, whoever God chooses is worthy of being saved. And Peter's revealed to him that whenever God has cleaned, you must not call common. That's verse in, in verse 15 of that same chapter. And so he goes to Caesarea, where he's at, where Cornelius is at. Um, <clears throat> uh, Peter is thinking about the vision, and the Spirit tells him that there's going to be some men come to visit you. You need to go with them, and uh, you're going to go down. And so in verse uh, 24, it says, In the following day, uh, this is chapter 10, verse 24. I know I'm jumping all over the place, Miss Kathy. I'm sorry. Uh, Morgan's going, I'm so glad I didn't do this today. Um, verse 24, it says, In the following day they entered Caesarea, and now Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and his close friends. As Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. That would, that would feel pretty good, right? You'd be like, man, I drove all this way. Man, this is not, this guy, thank you for your giving me honor or whatever. But that's not what Peter does. He says, he lifts him up saying, stand up, I'm just a man. I myself am also a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and he found many who had come together. And then he said for them, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation. And I like to think that this period and the next, the next word is one of those things that we sometimes jokingly call a, a big but in the Bible, right? It's a, he says, but God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. That's a big change of, of, of attitude in that one passage because somebody could take that and go, see, it's unlawful. But if you don't read it in its entirety, you miss it. And he says, therefore, I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. And I ask, for what reason did you send for me? Cornelius tells him that he was fasting for four days until this hour. And in the ninth hour, I prayed in my house. And behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard. Your alms are remembered in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa and call Simon here, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon. He told him where to find him. And then he says in verse 33, he says, So I sent to you immediately, and you have done well to come. Now therefore we are all present before God to hear all of the things commanded of you by God. In short, he begins to share the simple, I mean, it's just a few verses. I could read it in just a couple of minutes. But he shares just a couple of verses and he says that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And that he died and that he rose again in three days. And then he says <clears throat> but uh, that he was not to all people but to be witness, uh, witnesses chosen before God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it was he who was ordained by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. So he was telling him, all these things are great and God has seen them, but it is, it is Jesus who will stand to be the judge. And in order to, to be saved, to be filled, to do whatever, to be acceptable in the sight of the Lord, Jesus has to be the way. The truth, the life, it's only through Jesus. I pray this because I think about people in our world. Let's, I'll just be honest. You know, there are people in the world. I read, I saw an article today. I haven't read it. I just saw the article. It said Bill Gates gives another $20 million to help in aiding people who are without something. He's one of the most generous people in the world. I pray that at some time before that man dies, because he does not profess Christ, something would, a, a man in bright clothes would show up to him and say, Sin for name the preacher. Billy Graham ain't here no more, so I don't, <laughs> I don't know who you call for. But sin for somebody that they could come and share with you what it means to that, that Jesus is the judge 
of all of these things that you feel like are, you've almost single-handedly eliminated, eliminated uh, cholera and diarrhea from Africa. Bill Gates has. And that was killing more people than AIDS. It was killing more people than malaria. It was killing more people than anything. But all that doesn't mean anything in the sight of eternity without Jesus as the judge of that thing. So I pray, think about all the people in our world that are full of money but lack conviction, lack common sense to know this means what it says. That it, you can't buy your way in anything. I'm thankful because I don't think I have enough money to do that. But it says, I do know this, that it says that my salary, if I accept him today or if I accept him on the last day, could be the same. And that's because of Jesus. Only Jesus can write that scale in, in our lives. Amen. Can we pray together tonight? Father, we just thank you that this book of Acts is just builds faith in us. It builds uh, uh, just the desire to continue on in the face of adversity to continue preaching the Word of God, in the face of, of ridicule to continue to, to share that Jesus Christ is the way, He's the only way, He's the only sacrifice that was worthy, that there's no uh, sacrificing a mansion is not going to get us into heaven, but God sacrificing our lives unto your service, that's what's going to make, make it worth it, Lord God. We, we give our lives to you. We give our lives to Jesus Christ. I'm thankful for his sacrifice. I'm thankful for his power over death and, and the resurrection. Father, I'm thankful that he has done it all so that we didn't have to because we weren't capable. I just give you praise for it tonight. If there's anybody that's watching online, Father, I just ask that they hear this message, Lord, that they, that they understand that, that there's nothing wrong with you know, giving to the needy, to helping those that are less fortunate. But God, all the, the, the nice clothes and all of the giving to the poor and feeding the hungry, Lord, is never going to bridge that gap that we created when we called for the, the death of your child, your son. But God, thank you for his resurrection and your forgiveness. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.